Not everyone who's researched Bob Lazar believes his claims. Stanton Friedman is one of the most respected authors in the UFO field today. He's a former nuclear physicist with top secret clearance and has many friends and contacts in the Black Project world. I've looked at considerable depth into Bob Lazar's claims, both about himself and about propulsion system. Those are fairly elaborate claims. I've talked to the schools that he claims to have received degrees from. I've checked on his high school record. I talked to Los Alamos lab where he was supposedly a scientist and so forth. I have come up totally empty. Now when a guy lies like that, you get very wary. And you know, it has all the trimmings, his story, of a Walter Mitty story. Somebody in his imagination was, you know, stronger, brighter, faster than anybody else. I don't doubt that he did some work at Los Alamos and other places. He's clever, he drives a jet-powered car, fixes radiation detectors, so he may have performed some service. But I can find no reason to think that he worked out there on a flying saucer. I mean, I had to wonder whether this guy was making this stuff up, but then I see the phone book and I see the newspaper article and I talk to people who worked with Bob at the lab and who said, in fact, that he did work on classified projects, yet no one can find any records of his background. The people that I worked with, colleagues, the people I went to school with, obviously knew I was there, uh, and the people at Los Alamos, I was friends with, and people that worked under me and alongside of me knew I was there and, you know, cooperate what was going on, but, um, you know, officially, it's very difficult to get information for the people in charge. To further prove his claims, Lazar agreed to take a polygraph test, which he passed. The thing that uh, is interesting about polygraph is that I if you're embellishing or if you don't completely believe what you're saying, it is very, very easy to detect. Uh, all it really will tell you is that the individual believes with 100% conviction that what he's reporting is exactly as he recalls and as he believes it to be. And that clearly was the case with Bob Lazar. Now, could his perception have been a, a bit askew? Yes, that's possible. But he clearly wasn't lying. I think Bob has even opened to the possibility that perhaps he had been used in some sort of misinformation or disinformation campaign. I mean, look at him. He has a pirate flag floating on his house. He races jet cars. He likes uh, fast women. He likes guns. Um, he w he's technically capable, so in that sense, he may be perfect for this kind of a program. Technically capable, scientifically knowledgeable, and yet uh, completely discreditable at a, at a moment's notice. If you wanted to uh, test public reaction to a story about Area 51 and then suddenly discredit it afterwards, Bob may have been the most qualified person in the country. Lazar says that on one occasion he was escorted into the flying disc that he saw in the hangar to analyze its propulsion system. It was obviously made uh, to be piloted by something smaller than the average human being. Uh, very cramped in there. Um, what were the size of these seats that were in there? The seats were very small. I'd say about one-third to one-fourth the size of a normal human seat. A lot of people a lot of people say, boy, it must have been exciting to go in there, and I, and I always say it, it wasn't. It was a very ominous feeling. It, um, I know it sounds silly, but it, it, it's so unearthly in there. You have spoken to someone who's actually seen um, a UFO under a tarpaulin at Area 51. I have. Uh, I've, I've spoken to several people who've seen UFOs or disc-shaped craft out there. There was a there was a woman who was a secretary for a major defense contractor at the Nevada test site who worked on nuclear programs who told me that she had sat in on, on uh, conversations between military and civilian contractors at which the Roswell case had been discussed, at which it had been discussed taking some Roswell material to Area 51. Uh, the level of secrecy during those meetings was great. Afterward, they'd take the, the ribbons out of the typewriters she was typing on. She was ready to tell me about this, and I had this conversation with her on the phone. 
The next day after this conversation takes place, she's visited by two men who say that they work for the company she used to work for, reminding her that she is still under a security oath, told her, we know that you do a lot of traveling back and forth, a lot of long drives between Las Vegas and L.A. We'd hate for something to happen to you or your family. No interview. I mean, it happened again and again and again. Same scenario. Lazar says that in addition to being shown inside the disc, he actually saw it take off from the lake bed. I was brought into the hangar for one of the short duration tests and the craft was already outside on the lake bed and that was uh, pretty much of a marvelous sight. It's a huge thing. It, I, it's like seeing a house lift off the ground. You, you can't imagine the energy involved to do that. Because of the uh, extremely high energy output and the fact that the outside of the craft does is used as a conductor, that does ionize the air. And the crafts do, as a byproduct of this, glow at night, uh, much like a fluorescent tube will light up. So, you know, bright, strange jumping lights in the sky, that, that does explain that. Would you categorically say there is no way that, that hu humans could have built the craft that you saw? Absolutely. I will categorically deny <laughs> that, well, I don't know, how exactly should I put that? I guess I can just say it straight out. There is, there is no way that any government on this earth could produce that craft, period. And I defy anyone to argue that point. One of the big questions that's hung over this whole story is whether Lazar saw a man-made flying disc and not an alien spacecraft. A lot of these craft which are being developed in secrecy in, in the United States are tested at night. And one can imagine that seen through kind of half-closed eyes, something like an F-117 stealth fighter or a B-2 bomber, side-on or front-on, would look remarkably like, say, a flying saucer or a UFO. You see an F-117 or you see tacit blue um, or you see uh, a B-2. Particularly if you see it from some fairly unusual angle, you're going to have a very hard time relating that to conventional aircraft. Um, some of these things can look very strange indeed. Um, so, you know, an unusual but decidedly terrestrial aircraft um, can certainly present the appearance of a disc from many angles. I think for anyone who's, who's been out into the western United States and seen the kind of place it is and let their imaginations run riot a bit, it is possible to imagine in, its, in these vast test areas technologies which are highly exotic, highly uh, revolutionary and would change the way we feel about science today. However, to say that that is alien science derived from beyond this world, I think is something which is just, it is unbelievable. It's too much to, uh, to absorb.
do you think that some of the truth certainly lies out there in the middle of the Nevada desert at Groom Lake? I would expect that some of the truth may very well lie out in the desert near Groom Lake. It's the right place for some of it to be. It's isolated, it's under control, it's high security. I don't think we've yet scratched the surface on what's happening out there with regard to flying saucers. According to Lazar, the craft that they were secretly testing out in the desert at night used an exotic anti-gravity propulsion system. The reactor itself was an incredibly advanced system. This is, uh, was an antimatter reactor. This is something we could only dream of having, something that could put out huge amounts of power that rivals several nuclear power plants running at capacity. What happens is a great gravity distortion is created and you're essentially bending space toward the craft. The craft becomes part of that space and then when the reactors or when the gravity amplifiers are shut down, the craft is essentially where it was focused. It's a very difficult thing to grasp. It happens virtually instantaneously because of the fact that gravity distorts time. And if you're bending space and time along with it, when you wind back up in that place, you're there between the ticks of a clock. Looking at uh, nighttime video films out in the uh, uh, test site area, we've seen video of craft that were uh, luminous that would move across the sky as if it was uh, skipping a stone across water or, or sort of a sewing machine effect. What we see across the screen are a series of uh, lights, of dashes of light uh, as the object moves from point A to point B. Therefore, we are seeing uh, what you might call a shadow effect of the propulsion mechanism at work. Bob Lazar is not the only person who's come forward and claimed to have worked out at the base on flying disks. Former U.S. Marines test pilot Bill Uhouse worked out at Groom Lake and other top secret locations for more than 40 years, working for the Pentagon and civilian contractors on a variety of highly classified projects, including, he says, a flying disc recovered from a crash in Kingman, Arizona in May 1953. He said that he'd been cleared to do this interview and to discuss certain information but asked us not to show his face. What were you actually working on out there? One of the things I worked on was a, a flying disc simulator. It was designed in New Mexico by a, a separate staff that uh, built it uh, in parallel with the actual craft that they were, had intended to fly. The purpose of the simulator was to train pilots to, uh, to fly this strange, uh, strange looking craft. The simulator was a 10 meter round uh, disc. The skin was made of uh, boron uh, composite material. Not unlike uh, that you see on the F-117. How did you know how to build the simulator? There essentially there weren't any plans. The plans were generated as we constructed it. And it was a, there was a process there that, that took quite a while for, for us to even understand the concept way back in the 50s. Uhouse says that Lazar did work at Area 51. I think Bob is saying exactly what he knows and I know a little bit about Bob uh, from a different standpoint than a lot of the people know and what's been written about him, but uh, uh, Bob Lazar is not lying as far as uh, his place and position 
and the activity he was involved with at the time, although some of it, you know, he couldn't recall, but there's a lot of reasons why Bob was hired, number one. You know, here's the thing. Take a guy like Bob, send him out there, you know, somebody said, you know, aliens, blah, 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 blah. You know, all of a sudden you're thinking about nine alien crafts. You know, they may have not been nine alien crafts. Bravo 7014, contact deep, Archie, good day.